Hi, I'm Alec Baldwin, and I'm here with the one, the only, John Mauchery, and we're talking about his new book, For the Love of Music. I interviewed uh, Ricky Gervais, who pronounced David Bowie's name, Bowie. He'd say, it's David Bowie. I remember I once met David Bowie, he'd say. David Bowie. I said, is that how you? He said, well, that's how I say it, Bowie. Well, that's, that's how, how I say, say it. it. That, well, that's how we say it in England, Bowie. And your name is Mao Cherry, not Mo Cherry. That's right, or Maseri. I, like, I hated it. the Ma. Maseri? Is, is, is that the pronounced Italian no, pronunciation? No, 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 that's Long Island. <laughs> that's the Long Island pronunciation. <coughs> Mo, Mo I'm from Long Island. My, my pronunciation here would be Maceri. Maceri. Like my cherry. That's right. Maceri. Yeah, or the French Mon Cherry. Mon uh, Cherry. But it's not true. It's just now, Jerry. Now, before we get to your Leonard Bernstein anecdote that you had the, teed up uh, the <laughs> for before we started rolling the camera, I was reading and reading and reading about you. And, uh, you know, in your career, which uh, among many superlatives we can use, artistic and commercial, four million tickets sold at the Hollywood Bowl in an 18,000 seat venue, you know, in the years you did that. 16. One, uh, the 15, that's 16 years. That's a long run show. Long, that's a long running <laughs> show. You were more successful than Jimmy Fallon. But, <laughs> the, the, but the thing about it is that when you look at this stuff, of which that's just one component, it's so varied. I mean, you're at Yale and you study at Yale and then you conduct at Yale and you're, you're doing everything. You're doing opera, or you're, you're, you're uh, reinvigorating the Broadway uh, uh, catalog. You've done everything in the world of music. And what I want to know is what's the thread? What's the base of that? In this your childhood, your family, where did music, where was it born in you? Well, this is a, seems like a double kind of question because the th I'm a generalist, and I like to explain to people that if you're a specifist, you do one kind of thing. And when a, a specifist, for example, in music, would be someone who's an expert on Bach. And a specifist will look at all of Bach's cantatas and tell you about how they're all a little bit different. A generalist looks at a lot of different things and tells you why they're the same. So I'm always looking for that line that goes through all kinds of music that is the fundamental line of human expression. Because for me, music is the most mysterious and powerful art form because it's invisible. That makes it the m so mysterious, so powerful. It controls behavior. It, it, it leads someone to, to war. It makes people feel peaceful. It makes people feel closer to God. Uh, gerontologists will tell you that when people are losing their, facu their mental faculties, music can draw them back to some central line in their lives. Um, and in classical music, which is fundamentally the center of my wheel, um, there is, it sits there and waits for you to come to it. You can come to it early, as I did. You can come to it late in life. It doesn't judge you, but it travels with you the rest of your life. So in that sense, as a generalist, as someone who has conducted, you know, some of the greatest jazz musicians and opera singers and the great opera companies and Broadway shows and, you know, absolutely straight ahead pop, people, um, I look for what is that mysterious thing, that thing, that thread in the music that takes people to this special place. Mm -hmm. So that would be the answer to the, your question. The personal one, John, Little Johnny, why did Little Johnny do this? Well, where did Little Johnny grow up? On Long Island, just like you, just what like town? you. Uh, East Meadow, I was born in Jamaica, Queens, and Mary Immaculate Hospital, where my father was a doctor. And we lived in Laurelton, PS 156. I'm totally educated through the public school system until I went to Yale. Any siblings? Uh, an older brother. And that's, that's a key here, because Bob, my older brother, uh, loved music also. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was a musician. He conducted hotel orchestras. He was an immigrant from Sicily. He conducted at the McAlpin Hotel and at the Waldorf Astoria and out at Steel Pier in uh, Atlantic City. Uh, and then my grandma said, you gotta stay home. So he stayed home and he taught violin to everybody in Brooklyn. I mean, Unc my grandpa would walk around with his violin and teach violin. So that's where maybe I get it. Um, but here's the thing, um, uh, to quote something you know, here's the thing. 
Uh, it was also a relationship with my father. My father was very stern. My mother was very supportive. And I believe that my, um, my approach toward received wisdom, which is always to, always to challenge it. I was always challenging my father who would say, do this, and I'd go, why? So in a funny way, although my relationship with my father was not very close, it also led me to ask these questions about why is that considered good and that's not good? Why is this classical music and this is popular music and popular music is not as good as? So I think I've always looked at received wisdom and been more challenging to that received wisdom to find out what is at the root of it. So that's the other part of my career, I think. When you decide to go to school, and you go to a great school, obviously, you go to Yale. Uh, did you know, I mean, it, it, all through your teenage years, did you know that a music career was what was in the horizon for you? When I talk to people who knew me as a kid, Classical music. they all they always <laughs> say that. But but it was, I don't think, you know, you can, you can answer it in this kind of smart-ass way. I was never talented enough to do anything else, so I became a conductor, which is, you know, makes people sort of smile. Um, but in point of fact, I had uh, more performance anxiety playing the piano or singing in public. So that was your instrument, the piano? Yeah, I started playing the know, piano yeah. when I was four. I mean, and I, I, I would listen to music and then go to the, our neighbor's house, Aunt Tessie. Was, we called her Aunt Tessie because we never, that's how in those days you called your neighbors. You never called them Mrs. Little, but or nor she's just her first name. So out of respect, she was Aunt Tessie. And she had a piano. And I would go and figure it out at the keyboard. I mean, I didn't learn how to read music until very late, because I would just do what humans have always done for hundreds of thousands of years. You learned it, and you repeated it through mimicry. Mm -hmm. a, a little bit like how actors work. I mean, how, you know, you do this all the time. You are you are translating words that are given to you and you become those words. And I was doing that very early in, in life. So, I mean, that's where it all started. And people always said, well, you always wanted to be a conductor. I'm not so sure. I think I could have been a lot of things. But here's the thing about being a conductor. You have to have a natural ability to lead. And by that, I mean, when you say, let's do this, people say, OK, let's do this. It's not about being a martinet or something. When I was a kid and I'd say, in, in, on Laurelton, I'd, in Laurelton, I'd say, let's, let's skate today. And everyone would say, OK, let's skate. Or I'd say, let's color today. <laughs> OK, let's color. So right from the beginning, I was that organizer person. So that's a good thing. Because if you stand in front of an orchestra and you say to the violas, uh, a little less, and, and we need those notes shorter, they look up at you and they can do that or not do that. It's not like you have the power to change their lives. I mean, they, they either do it or they don't. And they believe that you're asking them to do that will make it sound better, will make it shape it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that's a first thing about, about the conducting thing, which inevitably came. In my life in theater, because I had one aunt, Aunt Jenny, who took me to Broadway when I was nine years old. And the other, an aunt on the other side, on my mother's side, who brought me to the Metropolitan Opera when I was 11 years old. So for me, growing up outside of Manhattan, my normal life was Broadway. I mean, in those days, I mean, we're talking about the original production of West Side Story, Music Man, West Side Story. I mean, all these, uh, Gypsy, uh, Ethel Merman, Mary Martin. Sondheim was just arriving. Well, who was that? He wrote yeah. the words to that? West Side Story, right? right? That's what he did. And, and at the same time, the Metropolitan Opera, we had, you know, Leontine Price, Birgit Nielsen, Renata Tabaldi, Maria Callas. Those are just some of the sopranos. And it was a gold, a double golden age. But it was just normal for me. So I came out of that experience just thinking that this was just the world of, of entertainment, of, of, of profound stories told through music. And it never occurred to me that one was better than the other. They were all great. I'll never forget I was going to do a film. And uh, the producer, writer, director said, I want you to play. Uh, the, the story was basically like a Miller-esque take on a man in a midlife crisis. And he put all of his eggs into his career. And his marriage is coming apart. But he happened to be an NBA basketball coach. And the, uh, the, the friend of mine who's the director, said, let's go see Pat Riley. This is in the 90s when I was much younger. And he said, we're going to go see Pat when he was here in New York and coaching the Knicks and his wife, Chris. And we're going to go to the school uh, purchase or wherever they were up there where they had the Knicks camp. And we're going to go there and watch them practice. Then we're going to jump in a car and go to Pat's house. Hmm. We're going to drive like 30 minutes over the Connecticut border and go to Pat's. And we're going to have lunch with Pat. And you're going to, you know, he said something very basic to me, which I was sure pertains to you and everyone who has that leadership quality. Because as you know, um, 
and I see this as I get older, it becomes more vivid, that a lot of people don't want to decide. They want someone else to decide, and there's a vacuum, and you step up and go, let's go skating, and everybody goes, okay. okay. <laughs> and, and there's someone's deciding because everybody else doesn't really feel comfortable deciding. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a wash in those people in my life, too. But I sat with Riley, and I said, what is it? What do you do? He said, well, these are men in the NBA, not the WNBA. He said, in the NBA, it's men who have been playing this game at a championship level. They've been the greatest at this game in their community since they were 10 years old or even eight years old. He said, then they go on and they excel in high school. They're high school champions. They're collegiate champions. And now they're in professional basketball. They're the greatest basketball players in the world. In the world. And he said, how do I get them to care one more night? How do I get them to play at that level and give it? They've been giving it and giving it and giving it and playing at that level. How do I get them to give it up one more night and inspire them to do it one more night? And when you're conducting, I always say this about music, and that is I say music is the most powerful art form because it can be consumed anywhere. Yeah. You don't have to make an, an appointment to visually engage film, painting, sculpture. <clears throat> I said with music, you can, you can consume the product jogging, laying in bed, having sex, having dinner, driving in your car. It is in your, in your, in your soul always, in every part of your life. So it's always more powerful than any movie or TV experience, always. And the second thing is that what I love is I turned to a friend of mine once and I said, do you see what's going on here? And he said, what? I said, they're all doing the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. One man or woman, in the case of, let's say, Marin, is conducting a group of people to get them to coalesce into this one This is service. a magic thing, by the way. Right, this ahead. is the power. No, I'm right. just going to say it because, because y you, if, if they ever had the machinery to wire up everybody in the orchestra, you know, EKGs, everything else, and also the audience, and this is something you would absolutely understand as an actor who spent a lot of time in front of live audiences. The audience is a participant in the performance, and you know that. I mean, you, the difference, of course, is that you, as an actor with an audience, are facing them. I have to feel them through the back of my neck kind of thing, but I believe that in the greatest performances, that great performances are an agreement. They're an agreement between the orchestra, soloists, and the audience. And all of us who've participated in great performances, and I mean participate because you can't really always make it happen, something clicks in and all those diverse people in the house, in the audience, become an entity. They are breathing together. They are also doing everything together. There's, there's almost no demurral. They are an, a force, a human force, a superhuman force. <laughs> An orchestra becomes that also. When that magic moment happens, and would that we could make it happen all the time, it's hard to predict, but when it happens, there's no stopping it. There's no such thing as a mistake. It wouldn't matter if a clarinet squeaks or a horn misses a note, because we are beyond the notes. We are in the thing that is actual music. The notes are not the music. They're the excuse to create music. And that is the power that makes live performance. I mean, you can listen to music all kinds of different ways, and because it's in the air and because it's invisible, it permeates our lives. But when you're in a societal experience of a live concert with an orchestra or with an opera singer, for example, I tell the story of when Maria Callas came back to the Met to sing Tosca, and she had not been at the, opera, at the Met for seven years, and I had never seen her before, and I managed to get a ticket. Um, and that's a whole other story. But anyway, I was there. I was, I think, a freshman at Yale. And when she, you know, in Tosca, she makes her entrance off stage. And, and Maria Callas, by this point, was just so world famous. I mean, she was a media hound, as you know, and everybody knew about her and about her uh, temperament. Anyway, she, she came back to sing four performances, I think, of Tosca. But this was the first one. And Puccini writes that, that when she appears, you first hear her voice off stage singing the name of her lover, Mario, Mario. And when she first, when we first heard Mario, and it was actually Maria Callas' voice live, nobody else was there, just 3,500 people at the old Metropolitan Opera House, there was a moment where the entire audience went <laughs> It, it was as if, and I tell this story, somebody down in the front stuck his finger in the socket, and all of us were 
holding <laughs> hands and we all went like that. And there's nothing like that moment. You, you, you can't predict it, but that's why live music, by the way, will always exist because of our societal need to participate in this thing. Well, I, I remember I, whenever I started to, um, I don't think I did this when I was purchasing CDs <laughs> back at Tower Classical on Sunset <laughs> Boulevard in the old days. I yeah. tell people that I would be in my car in the 80s before the internet and I'd have the car phone planted into the console of my car and on speed dial I had the program directors where an actual human being would answer the phone <laughs> at KUSC or whatever the, the, the classical stations were then. KCR, or there was one in uh, uh, oh. KCPB or whatever in uh, uh, Thousand Oaks. So there was a couple classical stations and I would dial the number because I'm going through the gates of Warner Brothers to get a job and the Respighi is playing and I call up the guy and I go, what's this that's playing now? No, no uh, websites where they post everything. Right. And I'd say to the man or woman, what's this that's playing now? They would say, they'd say, well, that's... Uh, Pines uh, of Rome. Uh, that's Pines that's of Rome, that's Fountains of Rome, that's uh, 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 Dutois with the Montreal, that's on the Deca. They give me the disc, they give me all the information and I'm scribbling it on a pad. I'm going to the guard gate, Baldwin. Yes, I'm going to see John so-and-so scribbling on the pad. Thank you, ma'am, thank you, sir. Writing order, go to tower. What is, order it, my discs. What is it about <clears throat> music? For you. I'm going to get to that. Go to Tower, order the discs. You've got to come back two weeks later to pick up the discs. No, no internet, no Apple, iTunes. Right. So now when I'm online and I'm buying it online, I'm downloading, I'm always looking for, because I'm a, I, I'm a, I always tell the same corny line, I'm always shopping for music to play at my funeral. I like Odagios, I like it very moody. And I'll say, I need my funeral playlist. <laughs> and I'll get there and I'll say, who's squeezing every drop out of the Mahler ninth, fourth movement? <laughs> High Tink paces it up a little too much for my taste. <laughs> Mazel drew it. And you read the difference in time. One man will play that same piece. Gergiev will play it a minute and a half longer. Yeah than Baron Boyne. Yeah. Some men pace it up a little bit and some men whatever. My, I'm gonna get to your, the answer to your question, but it, it's just that this idea that Mazel, Baron Boyne, Zubin, all these men that I've gotten to meet and track their careers and read about them, they all had a point very young in their lives that I wanna ask you what it was in your life. And when someone came up to them, not in a casual way, but it sounds so simple, they said, you know, you're very good at keeping time. And all of a sudden, the transition to conducting was introduced the idea. We want you to come and train as a conductor. When did that happen for you? When did someone suggest that you were going to step away from the keyboard and conduct? Well, okay, I'm going to hold on to the question I have for you and, f and answer this question. When I was at Yale in my junior year, I was just felt like I was floundering. I mean, I was composing, and I was a music major, and I was studying... French literature, I was doing, you know, the Yale thing, which is so great. You've got the greatest experts of anything you want in the world, and they're just at your disposal. What do you want to know? I mean, I mean what do you want to know? Exactly. What do you want to You're know? here. <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, it was pretty overwhelming, and in my sophomore year, I was studying German and Italian and French and, um, you know, and architecture. It was, and I, but I, but there was no f center to send. I went to the chairman of the music department, and he said, well, why don't you talked to Gustav Meyer who teaches conducting and I went to him and he he was the conducting teacher and he had studied with a man named Swarovski in Vienna who was one of the great conducting teachers of the 20th century he taught Abado he taught Zubin he was that and he this fellow Gustav Meyer was had came come out of that course and became a teacher as opposed to a famous conductor and I went to him and he took me on as a private student I had one lesson with him and everything changed I found myself walking around not worrying about practicing. I was practicing all the time. I was beating two against three. I was, it was just that everything in my life, all the different things, all the things I was interested in all came together because quite frankly, there's nothing in the world that you can study that isn't appropriate to learning how to be a conductor. Everything is useful, whether, you, whether it's the meal you had at a restaurant last night or whether it's reading history about anybody, anything, it all feeds into this cultural cauldron. So right now I'm working on Mahler V, for example. So you learn whether you're working on Mahler V, because uh, this is going to be my first one, so now I'm 73 years old and I'm doing my first Mahler V in Prague. And you learn that he wrote the third movement first. You want to talk about time? I mean, because yes, we deal with time. We are dealing with every level of time, because when I'm conducting, 
two kinds of times are always happening. There's the time of the very ictus, the beginning, the first thing that happens, but also I know where we're going. And so there's a clock that's going backwards and there's a clock that's going forwards. And I am aiming for that last moment, right from the beginning. I conduct, I may appear to conduct it in a naive way, like I'm discovering this with you, but actually I'm controlling this whole journey. So it is in fact possible for one conductor to take, say, the adagetto from Mahler 5 and conduct it in seven minutes, and another one to conduct it in 11 minutes, right? I mean, it's you talk about, right? <laughs> we're talking about to be or not to be, not. right? right, right. <laughs> not to be. To be. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> becomes the most magnificent moment for a conductor to understand the privilege of climbing into these works. Because we, we can go to the Sistine Chapel and look up and say, wow, God, that's amazing. But when you're a conductor, you're up there and you're changing some of the perspective and you're actually moving that this way. And you're partnering with Michelangelo, but you want to say, you know, I really want a bigger close-up on that right. moment. Lower the so lights I'm, yeah, where, Stand or, or, over or here. Can we bring the... Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so that's what makes music the most amazing thing. I mean, I am partnering with Gustav right now as we're taping this. I have access because of the internet that at the Morgan Library, they own the manuscript of Mahler V in Mahler's handwriting. Every page is digitally scanned and on the internet. I'm sitting with the critical edition that a number of musicologists worked on because Mahler, every time he conducted it, he changed this, he pitchki pachki this, he went, you know, it was weird. Uh, okay, so this was because of Cologne, this was because of Leipzig, this was because of Carnegie Hall. And then you're looking at the pristine idea of this score that he gave to the woman he had fallen in love with as he was writing it. By the time he finished it, he was married to her and she was pregnant with their first child. So we are dealing with an entire life force, a fifth symphony, which for any conductor, composer is the most important one because of Beethoven having written a rather famous one, right? So whoever you are, when you get to your fifth symphony, Shostakovich, Pressure's it doesn't matter. On. You have to like <laughs> confront that. And so he makes this thing in five movements, a fifth symphony in five movements, and the middle movement is the first thing he writes, right? And, and that piece composes the other pieces on either side of it, and you climb the mountain. And so I'm sitting there with the score, and on my screen is his handwriting. And you see what he changed, what was the thing, and you have the dedication on the cover to his wife, you know, his, his trusted, uh, beautiful, partner. He calls her a partner, and I think that's really important. We talk about classical music, most of the music in the canon, all of it in the canon, are written by white guys, right? So what is that relationship? How does that relate to women? How does that relate to people who are not white, who are not Christian, right? So you look at this and you understand the relationship of these great composers with the people in their lives who supported them and were their critical part life partners in getting this music done. So in the long run, to that answer to your question, is that time is in fact what we deal with. And I still never know before I start what that time is necessarily going to be. I remember with Stokowski, when he was 90 and I was 27, and I was preparing an orchestra for him up at Yale. He was getting an honorary uh, uh, thing uh, to conduct the orchestra. And I said to him, Maestro, in this transcription, sometimes you accelerate and sometimes you decelerate. You've recorded, I mean, I did all my research like any normal person would do for someone like Stokowski, and he said, wait and see, because he wasn't sure. Because as you start to tell a story, it'll change as you tell the story because of your relationship with the orchestra, the acoustics of the and room. each time you tell the story. Exactly, exactly. So you know that. If you uh, told it the same every time, it would be weak. Yeah, but yeah. you do that all the time as an actor. You have your points, right? But then, I mean, how... What role have you done that you repeated the most, if, you, if I could ask you that question? I would say, um, <clears throat> the, in terms of length of run, I mean, there are people who do a year or two or more. There are actors who have decided to park themselves in a theater for a decade, yeah. you know, doing Phantom or what right. have you. You know, Davis Gaines was right. there for many years. Great, great singer Davis Gaines. 
But the, um, uh, uh, you know, I would do with shorter runs. We do six months inclusive of the rehearsal and the tech and preview. We did Streetcar for six months in 1992. And I think whenever I do a play, I look at a play, and this is interesting, because you, 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 when you talk, you, you, you raise so many points for me, but um, uh, when you do a play, you know, the difference with acting, because <clears throat> I wanted to speak about this before, the difference with acting and, and everything else is, when I would see members of a band who could be Tom Petty at a benefit, mm -hmm. or it's the Philharmonic, or it's, it's, or, or, or it's the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra with Winton, whenever I see musicians playing, and I say they're doing, they're all in service of that same piece, and that conductor is taking them through and channeling where he or she wants them to go for that piece. You know, with acting, it's more like, uh, I, I only have a weak analogy, it's like fashion. When you do do a piece, I say to people, I make the shoes. I am the shoes. And the other actor comes and says, I am the cravat. I make the cravat. And the woman says, I make the, the, uh, the, 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 the blouse. I make it, in other words, the director is like a stylist who puts all the pieces, tries to find the piece they want when they cast, but they're not doing the same thing. Someone has to make them do the same thing. A lot of actors will come and go, I don't see it that way. And, and the more troublesome ones, if I may add, take the job and conceal that agenda of theirs. Then they come in and go, I don't see it that way. And they want to go do their own off-roading to enhance their, you know, their performance, as opposed to all of us being in service of the material. Some of the strongest and most uh, uh, successful and most uh, uh, enduring and uh, uh, powerful ensembles in all of the theater subtract the star element. You know, they're, 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 we, yes. don't, we, we don't want stars. That's right. When we have a poster, we have the company, or we have an image of, uh, of the Scottish Thane, or this or that. We don't have you know, uh, uh, Kevin Spacey's headshot on there, or whoever, when, when he was running the Vic. Uh, the national. It's more, uh, it, we're a company. A company, and we, and we don't right. And we don't accent the celebrity and the star system, which is, uh, you know, has its purpose, but it also has its, its, its problems. But, so when I would do a piece, I would always look at plays and I'd always say, could I go out here for several weeks and still be challenged weeks later? Mm -hmm. There's pieces that I love, okay. and uh, in, in, your, in, your, uh, 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 in your milieu, it would be like, uh, uh, pick a simple piece, that's a popular piece, and, and you go out and do it every night, and then after about five or six weeks after the opening, I go, well, I'm done with that. As opposed to a piece like Orton, the muscularity and the anarchy in Orton's words and choice of words, and, and I mean, I don't want to ramble here, but like whenever I do a play, I try to do the perfect show. I never get there. I mean, maybe two well, productions. Well, that's it, the aspiration. To me, it's, do I say the l lines as written, precisely, I don't transpose one word, because sometimes you transpose, right. you invert two right. lines. With uh, Schaffer, when I, did, uh, uh, when I did Equus on Long Island, and Schaffer was with us, and as you mentioned with Mahler, Schaffer was rewriting at the age of 85. Sure. As we were going on stage, he would <laughs> hand the boy who played Alan new lines. He'd say, he'd say oh, I, I have this, a couple of paragraphs. <laughs> and I'd like you to try, oh, it would be wonderful this evening. And he'd hand him uh, the, the piece. And I said to him, I, I mean, this is a story I've told many times, I said, when I did uh, Equus, I said to him, I said, Sir Peter, I said, I said, this play just terrifies me. I yeah. said, because it's so nougaty and rich, the words. I said, I said, it's like going down a black diamond ski run every night. And I know I'm going to fall. It's just a question of where. I know I'm going to fall. Just a question of where. And there's a pause. He looked at me and said, but I hope you find it thrilling on the way down nonetheless, my boy. <laughs> and I, he like, was like, you have the job so to did do. You change, so did you change, say, let's take Stanley Kowalski. So you're doing that for six months, or maybe the run is three months or whatever it is, and then you do it on television. But you, you must have felt the audience, in a, in a funny way, guiding you at some point? Well, there's audiences, there's, there's audiences that are demonstrative, and they, 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 they reflect back to you. They laugh. Mm -hmm. If you do something that's amusing, they laugh. Right. Then there's audiences that do nothing. Right. I mean, the classic Broadway audience is an audience that will, was one or the other. They're, 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 they're noisy, they, make, they, they, they show their approval or withhold it if they think it isn't working. Or there's an audience which does absolutely nothing and they're just listening intently. And then at the end, they burst into sobs. Isn't that the most amazing thing? There's just nothing. We do, we do streetcar and, it's, and we, we take her off. They, you know, the stagehands have a little thumbnail for each scene. Mm -hmm. on a card for the prop table. And scene 11 said, Blanche gets carted off to the nut house. Right. <laughs> How insensitive. <laughs> and that's what they wrote. And we would, they would take Blanche out, and the audience would be sobbing. 
if it was really, if we did it well. But my point is, is that you go out there, and that's what I want, is I want a piece where there's the room for me to interpret and play. Exactly. Today, Stanley's going to be more playful. Today, today Stanley's going to be completely ignore Blanche. The, the, the thing I prize, Stanley is a man that has one decent shirt. Mm. Right. Right. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, when we did Streetcar, I'll never forget, Mosher said to me, when the doctor comes, he said, I want you to look at his, I'm up and down, and look at his shoes. Yes. He said, he has very nice shoes, doesn't he? I said, yes. He goes, men who dress like that don't come down here to this neighborhood. That's right. Because you're embarrassed to let him in the house. You tell him to wait outside. Good then you bring point. him in only on an as-needed basis. You're embarrassed for that man to see how you live in this hovel. And, and, and I would do scenes where I, I was so in love with Amy, and I would play that I would, I would kill myself for Amy. Then there's other days I would play that I'd be like, you know, me and Blanche, maybe we go have a little th th roll in the hay. And well, you see, and you could more. do that. I'm right, whatever. and you can yeah, do that. Whatever. Same words, yeah. same words, a pause, a look, a gesture. And that's what we're doing without the words, because we're telling a story without words. Now, when you conduct opera, of course, there's a story to be told. But I want to get before you, but I want to yeah. get back to one thing, which is, so when he says to you, come and you're going and you're, and you're to start to keep time, you're going to start right. to study conducting, how long are you studying conducting? Is it inside the program at Yale, or is it beyond that, that you start to say to yourself, this is what I'm going to do? Oh, I, that happened almost instantaneously. <laughs> and what, was so, what makes conducting so um, difficult is that you can't practice it really until you have living people in front of you. I mean, people who conduct to a recording are doing the opposite. They're responding to something that's always going to be the same. But when you first have an orchestra in front of you, as a little orchestra, a big orchestra, you start to slow down if you're like thinking of something else, and it slows down. If you don't have your foot on the gas pedal, the car's going to just sort of roll to it. You know, the energy part of it, you start to realize, oh, I'm actually essential to this thing. And it is, when you get to the really great orchestras, they're like having a Maserati or something like that. You just move a little bit, and they move with you. They are, this is like, oh, I see. This is really serious the stuff, right? Engine. This is really, right, be careful, yeah. because this is, and you can, you can, the elasticity of Western music, this is one of the most interesting things about what we call Western music, which is the classical music we're talking about, and, and uh, is that it's built on very simple system, right? You have whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, and that's really dumb ass simple, right? I mean, this is half as long as this, this is half as long as and, and And they're usually the same number of beats in every bar. I mean, no music in, the, you know, you go to Indian music or African music, they're so complex, and Western music actually is quite simple from the point of view of its rhythmic structure. And yet, somewhere in the 19th century, and I'm not sure when that happened, something came that changed all of that because although the matrix is like this, you start to change the size of the boxes so you can slow down. You can go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, one. exactly, you got it. Right. Now, and they make entirely different impact. So in, in a Mahler symphony, you go yam da 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 And it changes with who? It changes with who in your mind? It begins to change with who? Well, it, it changes because you've taken the time of the place you know you're going to, but you're waiting and waiting, and then the power of that downbeat becomes three times bigger. But for the audience that doesn't know this, for the viewers that don't know this, the classical music, they said the guy was there with a staff and a stick. And when does it become so complex? I mean, I kind of know the answers, but I want to hear your view, your view. When does it become so complex? You have to have someone keeping time. Oh, well, ensemble. that happens as the ensembles get bigger. Right. I mean, right, Beethoven's period. Fifth, look, okay. Beethoven's Fifth starts with a rest. Everyone hears da 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 da, but it's da 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 dum, da 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 dum. He could have written da 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 dum, da 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 dum, but he wrote ba 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 bum, ba 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 bum. Well, who starts that? Someone's got to go or or <laughs> right exactly. So there's a place where the composer makes it essential, and then once a conductor starts being a conductor. They start making use of the fact that we've got a conductor, and they start adding something that they never had before, which is called acceleration and deceleration. Now, you can do dynamics. Now, think about this, Alex. You can write forte, and you can write piano. And you don't need somebody to tell you what that is, because forte, you're playing loud, and piano, you're playing soft. But what happens when you want the music to start to go faster and faster and faster and faster? You would need some, some, you have to measure it against some beat or other, some person. It can't be just everybody making that decision together. 
So once acceleration and deceleration happens, which is what this exciting thing is, because what I just did for you, which is dum, da, 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 is a completely different one from dum, dum, da, 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 Now one is rage, and the other one is the power of you know, some mountain or other. Now when you conduct Mahler, or you conduct Beethoven, or you conduct Wagner, the you're making the- ballet suite. There you <laughs> You're making that choice. Is this the place where you come down with it? Like, no, God damn it, this is where I'm going to. No, oh my God, look what's happening. Now, Lenny, for example, was like a docent in a, in a, in a great museum. And because he was introducing Mahler, not only to the public, but to himself, he would, he would go like, and here comes a really big surprise. Well, now look at this, here, here it comes. And he would add slowing downs and points of view. He would make that solo thing louder. He would do this slower. He would do more than what Mahler did. And you have that discretion. See, that's essential for people to understand. Meaning, I often wonder, this is going to sound like a silly kind of a, you know, uh, sophomore question, but I am fascinated by this. Because when I do plays, plays especially, because in films, uh, it, they're, they're always new. You're very rarely doing, uh, 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 you know, archival material. And the, and, the, and the screenwriter is around or is represented by somebody or not, uh, unfortunately. But in plays, you sit there and go, I, I literally try to say to myself, what would Miller think about what I'm doing? What would Miller think about what I, we did all my sons on Long Island? Sure. I think, what would he think about what I'm doing? I said, I want the character of Chris to choke me. I want him to become so enraged and to punch someone. We thought about all the options for the Chris character to express his rage against the son at the end of Act One. And in the end, I'm in a ball laying there sobbing, and while they're going, Chris, my Chris, and I'm crying and crying, and the lights go down. We had a great production. We had a great production. And, uh, and I said, I, I, I turned to uh, 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 Ryan Eggold, who was the actor, I said, I want you to come at me and you advance on me and you advance on me, and as you're advancing slowly, there's a music to it, mm -hmm. you're coming toward me and I want you to go, you're saying, and then you did this, and you knew this, and then you did this, didn't you? Did, and as he's advancing, I'm looking at him going like, why are you, why are we doing this now? Let's go have a steak right. and a baked potato and enjoy life. You just got, why are we wringing out all this laundry now? We'll talk about it later. And as he's seething, it's, and I want him to be twitching with, with, with pain, and then as you're close to me, if you strike me, all the tension goes out of the scene, right. as we all know. And I said in the, in the theater, I said, I want you to just, all your hands, it's like a, someone turned on a magnetron, <laughs> like a very powerful, and your hands just go, zoom, and you grab me by the throat, and I grab your hands, and I want you to choke me and take me down to the ground like you're Robert Walker in <laughs> right. Strangers on a Train. You're going the glasses, <laughs> you're taking me down, and I'm going, ah. And he's choking his father, and he dumps and you me on the ground. need score, by right, the way. Exactly. Exactly. We're going to get to that. We have a lot more ground to cover with you, obviously. It's very complicated. So he, uh, he throws me on the ground. And the point is, is, as I thought to myself, I said, and I go, what would Miller think of this? Because Rebecca Miller came, and she was like, that's a pretty heavy thing. I loved it. I mean, we, we have well, to here's go. Well, here's the advantage. When, when, when do you say to yourself, you take this liberty to interpret? Well, Mahler, for example, gives me that liberty. He See, th that's the How thing. How so? We, because we know in his own history that he would do that with Beethoven and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we know that he said to Otto Klemperer, who was his youngest assistant at the world premiere of the Eighth Symphony, if after I die there's anything in my music that's not clear, you are required to change it. And Stokowski said the same thing to me because Stokowski hid in the balcony in Munich to watch Mahler rehearse for the premiere of the, of the Symphony of a Thousand in, in 1910, I guess it was, or September. And, and the way he got in, he said, was he, he bought an empty violin case. And he walked in with the rest of the orchestra and said, Guten Morgen, and went up to the balcony to watch the rehearsals. And I said, well, what was it like, Maestro? And he said, well, the orchestra hated Mahler. And he said, that he, they hated him? Why? Because he kept changing the orchestration. So, in other words, Mahler was tuning his piece that was in his head to the acoustics and the abilities of the players around him. 
So when I study the fifth, I've got the critical edition and I've got his pristine version of it, which translated into acoustical reality will be different in Prague or different in New York because of that horn section is not as strong as that horn section, or you've got five basses here, but you've got 12 basses there. So I know that I have in one part of my brain the ideal version that he imagined when he gave the score to Alma in October of 1900. Then I know how he changed it as he conducted it throughout the rest of his life. And I know that I have what I call the parameters of choice here. And if I know that this story, this story that I'm going to tell now for the first time, I'm telling Mahler's story in 2019 of the Fifth Symphony, this amazing picture of life, of a near-death experience, because what happened to him before he wrote that is he almost died from internal hemorrhaging. When he came out of it and he was healthy, he wrote this happy scherzo about life. It's this wonderful waltzes and lendlers. And then when he had that piece, he didn't know what to do with it, and he decided, in my mind, to create the story of his life, because all of Mahler is about himself. I mean, Mahler, of all the egotistical composers, used himself as the subject. His he, illnesses. He's yeah. everything, his illnesses. No one loved more, no one hated more, no one was more heroic, no one was stronger, because this small, neurotic Jew who, who walked around, I mean, listen, I knew Hans Spialek, who was the orchestrator for Rodgers and Hart, and he was the orchestrator for uh, Cole Porter, and when Hans was 87, he told me that he had sung under Mahler in, the, in Vienna before World War I, and that the kids used to imitate Mahler walking down the street. And there was old Hans in my studio imitating Mahler for me, right? right, right you've had the picture this moment. And, and Mahler would, would walk and would stop and think, and then he'd walk a little bit and stop, and the kids behind him would do the same thing, right? And then he'd hear the he'd giggling, and he'd turn around, and the kids would hide in the alley. So now I have, so I have this direct picture of Mahler from Stokowski, who was watching him rehearse, and from Hans telling me this story. Now this is this guy who becomes the hero of heroes in all of these symphonies. So what he does is he writes a funeral dirge for himself, first movement, of course, second movement, the rage at dying at such an early age. Then comes the movement he wrote first, which is the joy of being alive. He falls in love with, with Alma and writes a love song for her, the Adagetto. And then the last movement is the moment of pure joy of all of life. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything. It's probably the last time Mahler is ever happy. So now I can view that knowing what's going to happen to Mahler. Because, you know, when you're all that happy, you know, it's like that great moment at the end of, of, of uh, one of the Seinfelds where some guy walks out and says, this is the next day of the rest day of the rest of my life as a rickshaw comes and splats him, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's what's what going on. It's a great moment. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I have... From research. Per, I have permission from Mahler In himself. In we call it authorizing. Yeah, I'm... I'm Who I, authorizes I, me to play the role that way? That's right. If and I play a doctor and I go observe doctors, people say, why do you go look at doctors? I go, not that I... I said, I want to do one thing. I want to authorize the nature of my performance. Do they really throw instruments in the operating room? I watched 100 hours of surgery. They do. They do. Do they yell at the nurses? So they here's do. my deal. My deal is I'm here to tell this story. And, I'm, and whenever I get nervous, whatever that word nervous means, because people sometimes ask you that question, do you get nervous? And I don't think that's an appropriate word. It, it, it's like enjoy yourself. I don't necessarily even enjoy myself because something is passing through me. This is monstrous. This is huge. It's like a low current running through your body when you're conducting, right from the moment you meet the orchestra, right from the moment you say guten morgen or buongiorno or whatever you say, and then you suddenly are doing this thing to after the performance when people like come and meet you and talk to you and everything like that, and you have no idea what you're saying to them. You hope you're not being a complete idiot. I mean, Lenny used to spend hours with the scotch and, you know, winding down because it is, it is crazy. I know that my job, whenever I'm feeling tense about it, is I say to myself, John, just tell the story just tell the story. And then all the choices become obvious. And the choices happen because of what just happened, because I know where we're going, and, I'm, and I have three times, right? I've got what just happened, what is happening, and what's about to happen. And also knowing that the clock is moving me inexorably toward that last note. And actually it's not the last note, it's what happens just after the last note. Never aim toward the, you know, I, I once did a, 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 a 
fear management course. I don't know if you've ever done one of those things where you're up on trees and you have to walk on wires. It's a, it's a great thing. If you ever go to, um, to one of those spa places and they say, we have a fear management course, and what they do is they have a series of trees and you, you climb up one after another and there's like a w two wires and a thing and they, by the way, they hook you up so you don't like fall to your death. But your brain forgets that. So you like walk from this one to that one. Okay, then the next one's a little harder. By the third one, and I'll remember actually the third or fourth one, there was a rope that was out of reach that was equidistant between where I was standing on this platform and the other tree I had to get to. And my job was to jump, grab the rope, and end up at the next place. Okay, so I went, all right, I have a nice pad on the ground for you? Well, they, they've, got you, they've got a carabiner, oh, you're, 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 so you're, you're, but your brain doesn't remember right, that. Right. But you're still up high. So I jumped, I grabbed the rope, and I got just to the platform, and my feet hit, it, and I knew I wasn't going to make it. So I pushed off, and I ended up where I started, but I was holding the rope. And the guy down there said, John, aim for the tree, not the platform. And I went, oh my God, right. I never thought of that. Right and I aimed for the tree and I practically yeah, went yeah. through the tree, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so when you're, when you're a conductor, you're actually aiming for the tree. After that last year, you're aiming for the tree and not the platform. I want to get to, obviously, the opera and, uh, uh, and the Broadway theater and the Broadway musical theater, but I want to, of course, uh, uh, talk about um, uh, film and not just in relation to the classical repertoire, because that was one thing that helped me to expand my, or it actually was more fuel on the fire of my passion for that music, was to go and watch uh, uh, the Kubrick's uh, uh, oeuvre and the, the classical repertoire and Barry Lyndon and so forth, and even Clockwork, and to uh, um, uh, uh, even watching some uh, pulpy uh, uh, cult film like The Honeymoon Killers, <laughs> that Tony <laughs> Lobianco, I, I it's, in the that. it's in the Criterion Collection where the great Shirley Stoller, who was an opera singer, who was a girthsome woman, who went on to become, uh, uh, she played prison matrons on One Life to Live on soap operas. Mm -hmm. And she did a movie with Lo Bianco years ago where she played uh, Martha Beck, the last woman to be executed in New York State. And she and Ray Fernandez, her lover, they went around the country posing as brother and sister where he then seduced and married elderly women and stole their uh, uh, retirement funds and killed them. They murdered, the, the couple wow. murdered a series of An women. An ugly version uh, of the producers. And, and, and uh, it, it was similar, <laughs> in, 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 in somewhat in tone, with the big difference being that rather than having this kooky score, uh, the, 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 the notes when they commit their most heinous crimes is the opening of the Mahler Sixth. Huh. And as they're bringing hammers down on the skulls of these, uh. bum, 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 you know, all this. I'm, I'm sitting there going, "Oh my God, this is the most obscene thing I've ever seen in my life." But I sit there and I go, "Mahler Six, mm -hmm. and here's this one, and here's uh, Hudsucker Proxy, and that's where I got into the Catchatorian." Right. And when you talk about da 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 I would sit there and watch Hot Sucker Proxy and I, I couldn't stop listening to, to the Spartacus Ballet. Movies as another window into music, great yeah. music, yeah. not just score, I mean, I mean not just a soundtrack like you know, uh, uh, um, you know, the Rolling Stones or something. Um, when, what was movie watching? I mean, you, you, you become someone who, who produces and, and conducts and directs one of the most popular movie-related programs in history. You, you, most people I know, whether you earned it or not, we're going to say on this show that you did earn it, oh, that you me. are the George Washington of live to picture. Well, I, in a way, I suppose I am. I mean, I didn't do it alone, just like George Washington, but in 1991, no one was doing that. I mean, right. when people were playing music to films, it was silent film. Mm -hmm. But to play music to talking film was, there didn't seem to be any reason to do it, nor was there any way to do it. So um, John Goberman sort of started that and, and really did. He had something called Symphonic Night at the Movies, which he did at Wolf Trap. I heard about this, and I got the program, and I took certain things out. And in those days, there was no digital. There was no, how do you synchronize? How do you take the music out and then somehow accompany a picture without some kind of help? How did you? Well, it was pretty exciting. I mean, we literally had a clock. 
and I would start a queue at 20 seconds before the hour. And I, I mean, the worst one was doing the opening of The Sound of Music. And I remember saying to the people at the Hollywood Bowl, um, you know, the bad news is that we've never gotten this right, so that when Julie goes, the hills, that we were actually at, the hills are alive, because there's this whole introduction, right, where Robert Wise has the camera moving through the Alps, and birds and church bells, and music is playing all the way through that, until the, the, uh, the helicopter catches Julie, she's spinning, and she does that. And, and we didn't have any, any way to actually do it, except I had to sort of memorize the thing. And, and so I said to the bold people, because I would always introduce this saying, you know, I have my prayer beads here, I've got the phone to call my mother, and you know, of course everything could fall apart. And we've never done it right. Well, I got it right that night and the audience went crazy. As we went through the years, we developed the techniques uh, because of digital projection of putting the old fashioned streamers, which is how they used to conduct music to a film. For those who don't know, a yeah. line on yeah. the screen. Yeah, what you did is you took the celluloid and then you took a, a box cutter, like that, and so you saw this line go across and when it hit the, the, uh, the edge, edge of the, of the that was the downbeat of right. something. Or you took a hole cutter and you literally cut a holes visual cue. and you saw these punches, which would set it, and Al Newman at Fox developed the click. Sometimes music is one tempo. And so, um, da -da -dum, da -da 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 -dum. all right. So we have three different techniques. One is the click, one is the stream, or the the punch, and one is the streamer. So we were able to do to put that into digital material so that the conductor is watching that while the audience is not watching that. So we could then accompany huge scenes like the ballet from Oklahoma or um, uh, American in Paris and do that, or Judy Garland singing The Born in the Trunk in the Princess Theater. I mean, that was one of the great nights at the Bowl because it was like having Judy Garland right there again because there was the picture, there was Judy singing just her voice and the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra accompanying her live. I mean, these were amazing moments and we did that for 15 of my 16 years, and that really changed everything. Also, I was privileged to, to meet some of the con composers. I mean, for example. Well, Miklos Roja was 85, um, and he thought the world had forgotten him. He was blind, he had myasthenius gravis, he had had a number of strokes, his wife was in a, a home, he was living alone, partially paralyzed. In California. In California, uh, up uh, Montcalm, and I, I, I went to visit him, and uh, well, here, before I even visited him, we did a great American concert. And I like to, to play American music and to, to disabuse people that all American music is the Stars and Stripes Forever. So I did an entire concert of immigrants. I mean, what is American music except a tribute to immigration, right? So, I mean, think about this, uh, you know, Gershwin, Bernstein, and Copeland. Right, when we talk about the great, who created American classical music, right? you know, Gershwin, Copeland, Bernstein, their parents all came from Eastern Europe. If they had been born in Eastern Europe, if the pogroms hadn't forced their parents to, to come to this country, those boys would have been born over there. What would, what, wh where would we be, where would we be? what would we be talking about yeah. right now? Anyway, but back to our story. So I, I started the great American concert with the Parade of the Chariots from Ben-Hur, right? And I said to, the, and we've set this up with his nurse, that, that Roja was listening on the phone because he couldn't leave his house. And, and I said to the audience, there was a phone, and I said, I want you to know that Dr. Roja is not able to be with us. So this is his 85th birthday. And, uh, and I said, hello, Dr. Roja. And I heard, hello. On stage. Oh, yeah, hello. I said, uh, Dr. Roja, this is John Mavcherry, and I'm here with 18,000 of your friends. And I held the phone, I don't know what, I went they like cheered? that. They went crazy, right? <laughs> so then we played the love theme from, from Ben-Hur. Now, I said, you know, I'm glad you were able to do this, and because this is Hollywood, we're gonna do a second take tomorrow night, and I'll call you tomorrow night. So Saturday night, we do the same, I do the same thing, play this, the Parade of the Chariots, I say to the audience, you know, and I said, Dr. Roja, are you there? Yes, how are you? And I heard, Wonderful. <laughs> so we managed to get him out of his house and to come to hear us record the Madame Bovary Waltz and the Spellbound Concerto um, at, his, at his memorial service. And they had, the family had me conduct the Parade of the Chariots at the, at the coffin. Can you imagine? Oh. Uh, and so I sat between Jerry Goldsmith and Elmer Bernstein, Oof. both of whom would pass away within that year. 
Jerry. Um, so, well, Jerry wrote a piece for me for 9-11, and Elmer wrote a, a fanfare for me at the bowl when we opened the bowl. So I'm a very lucky man to have touched this time that is now out of reach right now for most of us. And, and I always like to recommend to my students, find the oldest people in the world who care about what you care about. They want to tell you their stories, and they will. I mean, the idea that I can talk to you about Stokowski, and I can talk to you about Hans singing under Mahler, or I can talk about uh, these people who are gone now. And here I am at 73, mostly compass mentis, being able to be one degree of separation from these great people who created the world we're living in is, is the great privilege. When you would do the program, because I want to move on to something else, but when you would do the program <coughs> in the, at, the, at the bowl, and uh, you know, sometimes there were composers who it would be a whole evening. There would be a John Williams yes, evening, right, right, and there would be a, a, um, a Hitchcock evening. Right, and exactly. To show, and, and, you, and you did mostly packages of, of, of clips. You didn't do live to picture right, to too right. many films. No, we, I never did <coughs> an entire picture until right. much later. Right. And, uh, which, is, which, which is what people are kind of craning toward now. Yes, and I, yes. I, when I, I produce, as you know, the. I'm one of the producers of the Art of the Score program for the Philharmonic and in our conversations with people around the world to try to get the extant arrangements that they've already paid for. That's right. Six figures to, to, to develop this, this, this property. And we have to go out, for those who don't know, we go out and we try to find somebody who has an arrangement for the orchestra to play live to picture that special arrangement um, for Psycho. And we got, you know, because Simon Mattel just did it with the LSO or something over there a little while. I think, I think it was him. Somebody did it over there in London. And, uh, uh, and all the ones we want to do, uh, limitations, of course, because of the orchestra being on stage. Mm -hmm. We can't, we have to do Lawrence of Arabia in two different days, part one and part two, like Angels in America almost. And Barry Lyndon, also problematic. What, what fits? And uh, 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 of course, you know, we, 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 we doubled back in only five years of doing the program. You know, quote unquote, by popular demand, we brought back 2001 again because people loved it so much and it's so powerful. And, 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 and the orchestra likes to play it as well. Yeah. And we're going to do Sing It in the Rain, and we're going to do, we, we did a, 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 a On the Waterfront of the Godfather. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I said to Coppola, I said, uh, I mean, I don't mean to name drop, but I think I texted him and I said, or emailed him and I said, I took a picture of a huge close up, of a jumbo close up of, of, a, of a Pacino. And I said, Can you believe that 40 something years later, 45 years later, this movie still has the same effect on people. I mean, they, they played the opening notes yeah. of the, of the, the trumpet score. The trumpet plays the and, 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 and the place was just, you just felt everyone tense and, and engage, you know, collectively. Now, um, uh, when you leave Yale and you go, is it just legit straight conducting you know, of, of symphonics, or of the symphonic repertoire? Where do you go? And get, just give me a thumbnail of where your career goes. Oh, so I'm teaching conducting. at Yale. I was teaching at Yale for 15 right, years. Right, you taught for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, and then I, what? I, 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 but while I was teaching at Yale, um, I went to Tanglewood in the summer of 71 where I met Leonard Bernstein. Mm. See, and that, that was really Do a I feel a Bernstein thing. anecdote coming? There, there are so many of them. You'll just, we'll see where, what, well, well, we'll go there, but the fact is that 72, the next summer, uh, I had nothing to do. I mean, I had a, a year at the Yale Symphony where we did Stockhausen's Hymnen and we did Das Rheingold, and I found myself writing my dissertation, and, and Mass was being revived, and because uh, he wrote that in 71, that's when I met him, he was just finishing Mass for the opening of the Kennedy Center. It was being revived, and members of my orchestra were going to be the street band, and I got to go down to rehearsals hoping to meet him again, and he wasn't at any of those rehearsals. When the whole company went down to Washington, that's when I ran into Leonard Bernstein. He said, oh, John, you know, I, I didn't know you were working on this. And then I said the magic words, which I never planned, but if I'm Italian and Machiavelli was Italian, then we'd say, you must have planned this. I said, there is a public run-through tonight, Mr. Bernstein, do you need someone to take notes? What a good idea. Harry, give John a ticket to sit next to me. So suddenly that night, I was sitting in the presidential box with Leonard Bernstein taking notes for him. You're the Eve Harrington of it is a, It is Eve Harrington-esque. <laughs> The, but the, but then here's the logic of it. So first of all, you know, I, I, I get, of course, the, the pad, and I do the Virgo thing, and I have the, you know, Kyrie, Credo, you know, all this, you know, as big as I can make it so that I can read in the dark, and Lenny's whispering in my ear and, tell, and writing. And I have, by the way, this whole he's set dictating. of notes. Oh, yeah, he's saying, oh, yeah, more, more shotgun on Alan. More shotgun on Alan. What the hell is that? Yeah. Well, he's talking about the shotgun mic. You know, he was looking at the amp light 
on the on the, one of the electric guitars should be pasted over. I mean, that's the kind of notes I was getting. And then I was also getting meditation too too slow. You know, so when it's over, there has to be a meeting, right? And it's Roger Stevens, and it's Oliver Smith, and it's it's uh, I mean, it's the whole team. It's the greatest people in Broadway and theater, and me. Who is this guy? I'm sitting next to Leonard Bernstein, and I'm delivering the notes. And Lenny's giving them, you know. What was the production again? Mass. Yeah. Leonard Bernstein's the Mass. mass. And it was, it was Mass being, you know, brought back uh, with all the original creators. So the next day, there's a run through with Lenny. And I go right down to assist Maurice Perez, who's the music director. And Lenny is in the back and says, John, I need you. You need to sit next to me. And I thought, you're never going to have to say that again, Mr. Bernstein. Now, the, two, the conductor and the composer now are vying for me, and they put me on a walkie-talkie system. That I become, de facto, the most useful person in this. So I take the notes for, for both parties, the composer-conductor and the conductor-conductor. The notes are given, I go to the performance, and I think that's that. Leonard Bernstein calls me, the phone rings, I'm working on my dissertation, and it's, and it's Leonard Bernstein, who has gotten my phone number and said, John, I didn't realize you weren't being paid. Uh, I'm so grateful to you for having been there. And I said, completely honest, I said, Mr. Bernstein, I did that for me. I'm really glad it helped you, but I really wanted to be part of this. And he said, well, you're always welcome to any of my rehearsals forever. And I said, what are you doing next? Uh, now, now, now I'm being Machiavellian. He said, well, I'm going back to Tanglewood to do the four Brahms symphonies. I said, I'll be there. So now I go up there. We use all of our extra cash to stay up there, Betty and I. And, um, and I'm now, this year, now it says guest artist. I mean, I was a student the summer before, and now I'm guest artist. And Lenny was, you know, he, uh, he was so embracing of everybody. I mean, he immediately starts talking to me like an equal, like a colleague. What did you think of that? What did you think of this? Now, that's empowering. I mean, so completely empowering. I mean, he was such an extra, I mean, it's stupid to say what an extraordinary person he was. And during that summer, Heron Gentile, who most people won't remember, but he was going to be the new general director of the Metropolitan Opera. And he was directing a new production of Carmen, where Lenny was going to conduct Carmen, and Gentile was going to direct it, and Marilyn Horne was going to be Carmen, et cetera, et cetera. He was killed in a terrible accident in Sardinia, in a car accident, and suddenly the director was gone. I remember this happening, and I remember leaving Lenny and saying, thank you so much. And then, two weeks later, a phone call, and it's from Leonard Bernstein's office. Lenny feels he needs an assistant. He's not sure what's going to happen at the Met, and would you be willing to assist him on Carmen? And I said, uh, well, when would it start? And, they, and the voice said, tomorrow. You know that story, right? You've all heard the story. And I had to go, do <coughs> I want my PhD? Do I want to study with the greatest conductor in the world at the greatest opera house in the world tomorrow? I go, OK. Right, so Lenny gets on the phone, and he was so completely incompetent at technology. You know, Giovanni, he always called me Giovanni. I hear you're going to do this. And I said, let me give you instructions to get to my house in Fairfield. So now I'm sitting there writing instructions to Leonard Bernstein's country house. I mean, I'm a student at Yale. I mean, you know, can you, anybody imagine what this is like? He immediately cuts me off by pressing the wrong button on his phone. I call Betty, who's working at, at Yale at the Silliman College Master's Office, and she says, Silliman College Master's Office, and I go, Leonard Bernstein just called me, he wants me to be his assistant tomorrow, I'm starting tomorrow, Carmen, goodbye. And, and I must have yelled so loudly that the master of the college said, was, was John kidding? I mean, it must have been bone conduction was going, and she said, she didn't sound like he was kidding. So next day, next day I'm driving to Fairfield with my score to Carmen, and that's really how that starts. I'm still teaching at Yale. He then has me conduct, be music director of the Candide that Steve Sondheim and Hal Prince and Pat Birch are doing in Brooklyn. I'm doing that. I'm acting as his musical person because Lenny is not there and I'm putting the music in with them in this new book. And, and Joseph Cripps, the great conductor, is, has fallen ill and the, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic needs someone to take over next week. I get the call just before I conduct the Candide Overture from Ernest Fleischmann saying, can you come out here next week? We have this concert. We, uh, Leonard Bernstein says, You're, you would be a great person.
person to take over. And I said, well, what's the program? Well, it's Honegger Symphony Number no. 2, it's Mozart, and I don't know any of this music. And I said, well, really, I'm really sorry. He said, well, well Rudy, Rudolf Serkin, has decided to do the Emperor Concerto. And I said, well, okay, I, I actually conducted that last month up at Yale. Um, but uh, well, what else have you done recently? And I said, well, I did the Rite of Spring. He said, perfect. The Emperor Concerto and the Rite of Spring. Do you know any overtures? I said, well, I've done the Egmont Overture. Good, that's the program. Egmont Overture, says Ernest. The Emperor Concerto, Rite of Spring. See you next week. Click. And I'm like, so I, mean, I must have conducted LA. the Candied Overture, you know, in Brooklyn. Like, but, you know, and I get back and Betty says to me, she's so wise. She said, well, either you're a conductor or you're not. So let's find out. So I go out there. And that's my debut, my professional debut. I'm 27 years old. It's Rudolf Serkin, who's played the Emperor Concerto longer than I've been alive. And, you know, he's so, he was such a sweet, supportive man. Now, I don't know how well you know the Emperor Concerto, but there's a very famous moment in the first movement where there's a cadenza. At the end of the cadenza, the pianist plays a chromatic scale and goes up and ends on an E-flat. Now, if you don't have perfect pitch, and I do not, if you bring the orchestra in a little early, it's a disaster. If you bring them in a little late, it's worse. There's like this gap. So I say to Mr. Cirque, and I said, you know, I'm really only worried about one thing. He said, oh, you're worried about the, the cadenza? Oh, don't worry about the cadenza, my dear. He said, I, I will start the chromatic scale, and I will smile at you. And when I smile at you, you give the upbeat, and we'll be fine. That's the whole puncher on the, right, on the, on right, the strip, right, on the right. film strip. So he starts, you know, where you're done, dun, 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 you know, I'm doing this thing. And all through rehearsal, when I say to the orchestra, conserve the bow so that the small notes have more bow, he's sitting at the piano going, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. I mean, can you imagine having this? So we get to, to the moment in the rehearsal, Apart. and he starts, <laughs> and he looks at me and goes, and I go, bang, oh. and we're all together. <laughs> oh, my God. Sweet. But that's really musicians. That's who we are as a, as a family, right? Andre Previn said to me, it's the only club to belong to, right? It's the only club to belong I to. I would see people, I always, uh, I said this to, to, to Pavel Yerevi the other night, I said, I want to have your life. I forget my life, I want to have your life. Because I would see Dutois, and I would see Lauren Bazel, I'd see uh, Gergiev with his... Uh, you had to tremble low hands. Tremble low hand. <laughs> well, I mean, I would see men who would conduct and they would almost, you know, a, a, a court mazor would barely move. You wondered if he was really uh, still alive. Yes. He was very old and frail, and the movements were so high tinct, was so uh, 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 you know, economical. And then you'd see people sweeping and everything, and you'd see the, uh, you know, the personality. You yeah. know, you'd see the personality. And, uh, and I thought to myself, oh, the elegance and the beauty uh, to be a part of that. And you know, we carry a certain sound with us. That's what's so bizarre. You know, you put Stokowski in front of different orchestras and there's a Stokowski sound. There's some people who claim that there is a sound that I get. And I understand that. It's not that I'm better, or, di but I'm different from. And when I stand in front of an orchestra, there's something about how I, I grab them in this kind of strange orb. I, I know that I'm, my body is indicating something that in that will inevitably translate itself into how they're going to play. Now, is the job for you, I don't view this as a negative, is the job for you one in which if you're going about this and you want someone to do something and they don't do what you want them to do, do you say to yourself, this is a partnership and I have to take that into consideration? Or is the conductor's job to say, you must do what I instruct you to do? Well, when you, when you, when you my, get those rare impacts. No, I understand that. Um, I, I once got angry. And it just completely didn't work. Uh, and so it's not how I get my, my way. I mean, how you get your way um, is different for every, you know, I'm sure that Bruno Walter, as a young man, got his way in a very different, from when he was 80, and he would say, my dears, let's try this again with a little more bow, and everybody does it. I find as I get older, there's much less resistance. There's almost no resistance. I mean, why would they resist me? I mean, I. You know why? What is the what is the what is the upside of that? But I do remember as a kid, uh, in my twenties, conducting the Cleveland Orchestra, and John John Mack was the famous oboist 
a very famous student of Tabito, a great, great oboist, and I was doing Hindemith's Symphony of Serena, which they had never played. And we got to the Andante Grazioso, and he got to his solo, and I'd studied Hindemith's recording, and I knew just what it was, and I said something to him uh, in front of the orchestra, which I never should have done, about how he would phrase it. And he said to me, you do the Andante, I'll do the Grazioso. There was a real moment, and I went, okay. And the thing is that you can fight that. You can, like, walk off the stage, right, and do all that stuff, but you don't ever gain. You know, I remember doing the West Coast premiere of Benjamin Britten's Death in Venice. And the thing about Ben's last opera was that it's a, a seven percussionists, and they're playing every kind of thing, every kind of instrument you can imagine that you hit. And at one point in the first rehearsals, and I, again, I was now, I was 20-something, and I said to the percussionist, well, what are you using for an Indian drum? And he said, an Indian drum. And I said, this was good because I'm a New Yorker. Ask a smart-ass question, get a smart-ass answer. Everybody laughed and we were friends. You know, so it's as simple as that, like you deflect. If you want to walk off, you know, uh, the stage and, you know, do that, it, it really doesn't gain you anything. I mean, I know Reiner terrified, terrified them. You know, just those eyes looking over the glass. Zell. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. And of course, in the early days, you could fire anybody. You and you know, and, and Toscanini and various. There was a certain. It was terrible. That's why, when people complain about unions, I understand exactly where that came from because of my people, my conducting. You know, yeah, back then people lost jobs over personality oh, right, issues. Right, right, right. Or you'd ask the third stand inside a violinist to stand up and play the passage, and then he wouldn't have a work, you know, and during the Depression. So I really get that, that we, but we're in a much better place out of mutual respect. That's the thing, it's mutual respect. When I start with a new orchestra, for example, as soon as I give a downbeat, there's a sound that you come to respect. You say, ah, or they play slightly behind the beat. Some orchestras, like in America, they play exactly on the beat. Others you do, bong, because they see your intention, but they wait to play together afterwards. Now, this can drive a person crazy. I mean, talk about Stephen Sondheim, it could drive a person crazy, because you are literally a quarter of a beat ahead of all the music that's happening. In addition to which, for those who might understand this, your indications are always one beat ahead to begin with. So if, I'm, if something's going to be loud here, I indicate that loudness by how I prepare it. It's like when you hammer, you go, that means that that's going to be loud. This isn't loud, this is bang, right? So already my, my gestures are exactly one beat ahead of what's going to happen. And some aren't, some conductors aren't. I watch, some are ahead and some are on the beat. Well, there, is this, is re this is really dangerous because the preparation tells everything. You know, if you have a nail and you're going to hammer it into the wood and you want it to go in a little bit, you do that, right? Because that tells you what that's going to be. Prime it. So everybody, yeah, you, you know, so your upbeat is going to tell you. So if beat one is loud and beat two is soft, you'll see me go, and I'm already at the soft place before I've even hit that beat. So that is the language of conducting. It is indicating what's about to happen. Now, if the orchestra is also playing late from all of that, you, can, you just have to like, move the card in your brain, and you, you'll be just fine, but you really have to. Well, why do some play on the beat, conduct? Well, I think, I think well, conductors will, will um, kind of have a voluptuous moment inside the beat, but still they always have to They're indicate. They're They have to be. They have to be one beat ahead. When you conduct, uh, and you've worked uh, extensively in the opera, and yeah. when you conduct in the opera, you, you have to add that other uh, uh, layer of the Boy, do you ever. Of acting. And as we, <laughs> and as we said between, uh, I, I won't name names, but there was one opera company, and there was another opera company in a certain city, and they said, well, that opera company, they're, they're the great singers, but not very good actors, and the other one, they're great actors and not very good singers. One had a strength over the other, one had a strength over the other. And what's that like for you when you have to direct people's acting? Well, here's, here's the most amazing part about this, is that ultimately you have to understand that all of this 
cold opera, this mess, because I write about this in my book, because it's the messiest thing, and it's also the epitome of everything. Because it's the thing that really goes back to ancient Greek drama, which was sung. I mean, it is the essence of who we are as humans. Uh, we, we, whenever we have a ritual, we play music and we march in, in rows, or we put on some kind of shmata. It doesn't matter where you are in the world and where you are <coughs> in history, you know, whether you're marching with torches or whether you know, you're doing Aida, it, it's, and where you're marching with torches, it's all part of something in us, in our humanity. But the thing about opera is that the human voice is carrying the, the character and the spirit of those characters, of, of the people they're playing. So it's not that you need to have a 15-year-old Japanese girl to sing Madame Butterfly, which is physically impossible anyway, but so we, we dress that soprano as a geisha. She says she's 15 years old. We don't take that literally, but we understand that the voice that Puccini has given this character is actually what we're talking about. So at the end of the day, we all have to express our admiration for these people, who, these brave people who are working on two little muscles of their throat and are telling this story. Now here's the most interesting thing about opera. The part that I really love is because the way the orchestra interacts with the singers is something that is always changing. Sometimes the orchestra is supporting what the singer is saying. It's amplifying what the singer is saying. Sometimes the orchestra is, is being the audience responding to that singer. So for example, when Mimi says, sto bene, I'm perfectly healthy, I'm fine, she's not fine. Now you can play I'm fine, where the orchestra plays with full vibrato, or you can play it without vibrato, indicating that she is really dying. So by the way we color our relationship with, between the orchestra and its responses to this singing, is the way we tell this story. The, you know, in the Wagner operas, everyone thinks of them as being loud, and they're not loud. What happens is that when a singer stops singing in the great Wagner operas is when he finishes the deal, and that's when the orchestra gets loud. In other words, Wotan says, before Wotan says, you know, goodbye to Brunhilde, what happens in between is purely orchestral. It is the explosion of the unspeakable emotions. And then when they start to sing, you pull back and focus back on them. So I, I always look at cinema, by the way, we were talking about that earlier, as, as more, when cinema was invented around 1897, it was really doing what music was already doing in telling stories. Focusing sometimes on a close-up, on something that is a medium shot, a two shot. You know, the end of, of act three of La Boheme is a perfect example. Now, Puccini writes that in 1896, which is just when movies are being invented. But he didn't know what movies were at the end. But remember, at the end of, of, of act three of La Boheme, we've just had this double duet between Marcello and Musetta, and we have Mimi and Rodolfo. And they've decided to stay together until the spring. She, and she says, Vorrei che eterno durasse il verno. Would that spring would just last, would come and last forever? But would winter last forever so that spring would never come so I can stay with you? When she says that, the indication is that it begins to snow. But there's another indication which most people don't know. It says, here the curtain falls slowly. Now you know a curtain, whether it's in an opera house or it's in a theater, it, it falls in about a second, maybe a second and a half, but there's still another, another 30 seconds of music in this act. What does it mean? Well, here's what it means. It means that in those days, the curtains did not fall like a guillotine. They fell like this, mm -hmm. right? And you had, drapery. you had a guard upstage on either one walking with it to make sure it didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. So as they're singing and as it's snowing, this is happening. The aperture is closing. It's the closest thing to a close-up in, in, right? And so when it finally ends and, and they go off directly upstage and the music goes, padum, that's the closing, lovely. right? It is completely lovely. And I, I never saw that in my life until I was at Covent Garden and I was conducting it there. And I said to the stage manager, Stella Chitty, who was you know, one of these iron women who ran the stage at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, I said, Stella, can we just try this? Could, and she said, oh, Meister, I don't think so. First of all, people will think I've made a dreadful mistake starting the curtain early. And, and also, they'll start applauding. And I said, but Stella, couldn't we just try it once and give Puccini a chance? She said, well, all right. I suppose. I suppose we could try it. 
And when it started, you know, because peripheral vision is much more acute than straight ahead, right? We're built so that we see danger coming from the outside. So if I'm talking to you as an actor, you know, if you start doing this, you know, Captain Queeg, if you start doing this, everyone's watching this and no one's watching this because this. So what happens is it started coming down and there was this little moment where the audience, you felt a jolt behind you and then they completely understood and the snow was falling and there was Jose Carreras, you know, and, and, and then when it went pa-boom, the place went crazy. went crazy. And I thought, <laughs> bravo, Puccini. <laughs> My last question for you. When I would do plays, uh, you know, drama uh, is, is, is trickier because uh, a good drama is not always, but it, it, can be, it can be very simple, but can also be something very complicated in terms of the staging and the technical. And uh, uh, I did a reading at the University of Michigan uh, as a favor to a friend of mine, as a favor to Van Beeson, who left oh. uh, the film to go to uh, the music academy there. And we did uh, Death of a Salesman, which is complicated because you're leaping in time and there's sure. lighting cues, which. We could never render, uh, 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 you know, effectively in a, in a reading, but we did our best. And the reading, the text is there, and it, it went pretty well. But when I look at comedy, uh, where uh, you know I've done a bit of comedy on, on TV and in movies and on stage, a bit. Yeah, well, I've done, I've done a little <laughs> bit uh, uh, now and then. You look at uh, uh, you know the material, and sometimes it's more cute than funny. It's not really yeah. that witty, but the ones that I think are really witty, like Orton, but the ones that I crave, I, I never get tired of them. And uh, so there's some ones that I love because they're challenging, and then there's others that just fit me like a glove. They're just like an old shoe, you know, that I really, really love. What's that for you? What's a piece that you'd conduct, and you sit there and go, ah, my old friend. And what's another one you sit there and go, oh, shit. Well, this is <clears> going to be a real The oh, shit climb. moments are, are actually the ones that teach you the most, uh -huh, right? Sure. Because when you get to the oh, shit moment, you have to say, why does this piece exist? I mean, that's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, I never have to ask that question with Wagner or, or Mahler. I never have to ask that question with Verdi or Puccini. I know why these pieces exist. I know why we treasure them. But when you get to something like the Pearl Fishers or Gounod's Faust or works that never, as, as my mother would say, spoke to me, um, you have to go, why does this exist? And, I, and a good example of this would have been when I was asked by the Chicago Lyric, in, in, in two cases, one to do Romeo and Juliet of, uh, of Gounod and one to do uh, the Pearl Fishers, two French operas, and I never had a particular affinity for them. So here's what happens. You start, the oh shit moment is, well, do I say yes or do I say no? And I point out in my conducting book about many, most times conductors do not have the privilege of choosing what music you're going to play. You're asked to do something or you're given a soloist and that soloist is playing this piece this season. So yes or no. If not, you find someone else. Mind you, if you're the most famous conductors in the world, you can choose that. So what happens is that you have a certain detachment and you look at this thing. And in the case of the Pearl Fishers, which is as good an example as any, I mean, there it's by Bizet, so you know Carmen, right? Masterpiece, one of the great masterpieces of all time. And this piece does not resemble it at all, right? You have two guys who love each other and love this girl. And so you've got this thing in three acts with three soloists. And then you start to look at the way the libretto is set up, where each person has a solo, each couple has a duet, and then what happens at the end is that one of the boys so loves the girl and so loves the other boy that he gives them to each other, even though he may risk being killed. And so I realized that it was a Christian parable. You know, French operas tend to be very Catholic in their underpinning. And I realized that this was not an opera that was an action, like. Tosca is an action opera, right? It's all about action. But this was a parable, and we were setting up, we were telling a story as if we were in church. And that allowed me to conduct it and allowed me to find its structure as almost, almost like a cathedral. Now, when it's a piece that you just feel you own, you have, you have this feeling that you're in, you're in the stream, you're in the, the land that you were born into. The center of my wheel has always been Wagner. That happened when I was a teenager. And I can still remember hearing Tristan for the first time. I'm doing my history homework, right? I'm 15 years old, I don't know, whatever I am. And I'm sitting at my desk and the big speaker system that my brother and I built together are on either side of me and I'm listening to a broadcast of the Flagstad Fort Wengler recording of Tristan. And I'm doing my history homework and there's the prelude that I'm hearing for the first time. And then the whole first act and then the moment comes where Tristan und Isolde take the love potion. And there's this moment where the prelude comes back. And this music that you hadn't really heard 
for 40 minutes comes back and I dropped my pencil. And I suddenly heard what had gone on from this piece to this moment. Memory had clocked in and I said, I have, I have to hear this again. And so that is the music that I feel like I most, that this is where I, this is where I live. It's home. I mean, I tend to conduct Puccini more as if he were, you know, Wagner, because he's always quoting Wagner. So when we meet, passes out in the first scene, the first scene, there she is, she's, she's looking for the key, the candle goes out, and she faints. What is that music when she faints? Well, that music is the climax of the Prelude to Tristan. It's the same chord, except it's played pianissimo. And Puccini is telling you subliminally, she will die. This is love death. But he does, he's, he's putting these little clues into the music. Again, again, look at, at, at Carmen. Ma Carmen adorea. Yen's last line is da da di da 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 Tristan and Isolde. See, he's dying, he's going to be killed, he killed her for love. So I hear his the Wagner, the tentacles, the influence he had on everybody that continues on today in film music with the use of leitmotif. So whether that's John Williams or, or, uh, or anybody, I, I hear that line. So that's where I'm most comfortable. That doesn't mean I'm good at conducting it. It just means that I love it. And sometimes you can argue that having a certain detachment is in fact what you need. Betty Bacall used to say, you know, Lenny, you know, Lauren was, was one of the funniest and most acerbic wits of all time. You know, no performance is as good as the one Lenny's imagining he's conducting, she would say, right? <laughs> right? Right. They were neighbors. <laughs> I know they were neighbors and they loved each other, but she was so funny about that. I'm going to ask you one question. I asked you earlier, what is it about music that spoke to you? What is it that you care so much about this? I was doing a, I was doing a television show. Here's two, here's two facets of the same stone. I, one day, and I've said this many times, I, my character is killed off on the show. And truly, uh, 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 David Strathairn, the great yes. actor, movie actor David Strathairn, and Jamie Sheridan, another great actor, both play two men. And my character was a ne'er-do-well. He was a grifter. He was a thief. And the two men, and I'm in a flop house hiding from uh, my, uh, my, my uh, About pursuers. About what year is this? Around? Uh, in 82. I'm okay. getting killed off the soap opera. And um, the, uh, 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 the two of them both shoot me at the same time, unaware of each other's presence. <laughs> One of them is aiming challenge. a rifle <laughs> through a window to murder me. <laughs> And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and I open the door, and there's Dave, J D uh, Jamie Sheridan. And Jamie Sheridan goes, boom, and he shoots me. And David Strathairn goes, boom, and he shoots me in the back. And they both shoot me. And while it's playing, I turn on the radio in the room. I'm pacing the room out of abject fear that they're coming. I know they're closing in on me. And this music is playing. And our casting director was this wonderful, elegant, crazy, bon vivant, with seer sucker suits and sucking on a Newport. <laughs> Roger Sturdivant, the great Roger Sturdivant, <laughs> who he and his partner, Pat McCorkle, were two of the biggest casting agents in New York. Pat McCorkle, I remember Pat, Pat McCorkle. Sure. So uh, uh, McCorkle Sturdivant was the company. And Roger Sturdivant, who talked like this, he was on the edge of the stage where they used to smoke in the studio in the mm. 80s before they killed all that. He's smoking a cigarette and sweating, and he was always very clammy and very, uh, uh, very uh, um, colorful. And I said, what is this music that's playing right now? This music, I mean, it was one of the, I mean, I heard, you know, in, in seventh grade or eighth grade, we had a guy named Fred Stoll who made us listen to the Manati, the, the telephone, the medium. Oh, there, was, there was latent learning. They, they made us listen. We'd all sit there in the class and go, yeah. hey, come on, you know, yeah, what, what, is what, is yeah, yeah. what is this stuff? What is this? I mean, you know, the telephone, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but it stays with you. And then all of a sudden, latent learning. And we're there, and stirred him. It's, 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 it's a progression. And stirred him. Sort of smoking a cigarette, and I go, what is it? And he looked at me like I was a child. He mm -hmm. went, oh, it's the Symphony Fantastic, the March to the Scaffold. Like, oh, doesn't you everyone moron. know that? Right. He said, this is the March dun, to the dun, Scaffold. Dun, dun, and they're dun, playing dun, the March dun, to the dun, Scaffold, dun, 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 and then I get killed. And uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the dressing room, and uh, uh, the guy who was this, you know, uh, overweight, balding, the, the, the eternal bachelor, he's my dresser, you know, Larry Finkelstein or whatever his name is, I forget, his, it's gonna come to me, his real name. And I'd say to him, I go, what was the, what, what was your weekend? Lovely guy. And I'd say, how, what was your weekend like? And he, he, he'd say, oh, I went to go see uh, uh, Wagner. I, 
that and that of the opera and the, and the the fandom and the passion of the opera fan, yeah. which is singular. Yeah. There's the symphony and there's the musical, but the passion of opera people who have to scrounge oh, the yeah. money to buy the ticket. Oh, yeah. This guy oh, yeah. doesn't have any money. Right. He's a union stage worker on a, on a TV show. And he looked at me and he, and, and he acts out. He just turns with the flourish and goes, Hagen, was tust du? Hagen, was das du? And he acts out the scene. And I sit there and I go, I have to know what he's talking about. I got to find out what is the march to the scaffold and who is Hagen and why are all these people like practically wetting their pants in joy over this music and this role and this uh, you know Hagen. These what are, are you two doing? great moments Hagen, in what classical have you done? music, right? Right. right. And, I, and, I, and I run out and I start to explore. So he was at explore. Goethe Demrung last night, is what basically he was. <laughs> he, he went to see <laughs> Goethe Demrung, right? With money from, he didn't have, right, from to seven in his the passion. evening until one in the morning, right? <laughs> and he was dressing you the next day. Oh, it's and an amazing really moment, me too. Into that, into that. And I just said to myself, I, I have to know what they're talking about. And, and plus also, popular music uh, 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 left me on the side of the road. I always say the same distilled, silly phrasing. I say, you know, when I, in the mid-'80s, when I really picked it up in 85, 86, I said uh, it was when I started to collect and learn more about Sibelius and this one and that one and what well, you know who, who was uh, you know batteries between uh, you know Schulte and the Chicago and you know why was oh, yeah. uh, why, why was Dutrois recording career so seminal with the Montreal they did a lot of recording blah 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 who was Lenny why was Lenny so famous what well, what did he do and um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the class, uh, popular music was all, you know, why don't you love me? When will you love me again? Hey, you can stop loving me now because right. uh, I love her, because I love him, anymore. you know, right. <laughs> like, uh, and whatever the music was. And I said, well, this is for young people. Right. And I'm not so young. I'm in my 30s, and I just abandoned popular And they're three-minute hits. They're, they're three minutes long. And when you get to Goethe Demrung, it's five hours, and you're telling a story that's a fundamental story of human uh, But here's the thing. What you're telling me, though, which is what's so great about it, is that at that moment, you pursued it. It pursued you. It was there. It was just sitting there waiting for you, right? The Symphony Fantastique had been there since the day you were born and before, and Goethe Demmerung was there. And, and the same thing kind of happened to me, and that's what's so interesting about it. When you open the door to classical music, when it, and you hear it, and you go, I want more of that. And what's so great about it is that the actual central canon is not so complicated. It's not so many operas. It's not so many symphonies and composers. Once you're in there, that group of 200 works, whatever that is, becomes the point where you can go away from them to other works or you can just hear them a time and time again with new interpreters because even though they may be 100 years old or 150 years old, they're always contemporary because of the next conductor, the next Brynhilde, the next production, the next violinist who's going to play it. And so they're carrying on that line. So in a way, classical music is always contemporary. It's always with you. And it will well travel with you the rest of your life. Well, I, you, you have an elegant and beautiful uh, 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 expression there. And I'll use a very coarse one, which is I said to someone, popular music and classical music, I said, do you like to have sex very quickly <laughs> and very convulsively and get it over with? Or would you like to have sex where someone holds your hand and they run their finger through your hair? And eventually we'll get down to whatever it is we're going to get Business. down to. I, I said, I said Judith Raskin would sing the, the, the Mahler fourth, and Judith Raskin was running her fingers through my hair and holding <laughs> my hand. We were going to get to the, the business later on, but I like it a little more, like run your fingers through my hair. In classical music, we, always, we took our time, and I felt it come into me when I heard the Mahler fourth. The, the two pieces that took me were Judith Raskin, Zell, the Cleveland, yeah. and the Chicago uh, with, with uh, Schulte and the nine, the Mahler nine, and just Mahler just came into my life, and it was just, he was my friend. And he is your friend, uh, yeah. and, and he wants you to know who he was and is because you are part of him and he is part of you. And even though you have not experienced everything he's experienced and vice versa, there's so much in there that you can um, become an empath, empath. You are empath. You are an empath. You and it are one, and it's all about the story of humanity. It's who we are. And that's why at the end of life, it's still the place where we, we can travel back to that, that source. And at the beginning of life, it's what travels with you. So that, that for me is the reason why I wrote this second book, because it was, why do you love music? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? And why does this music, for example, why has it taken over the world? I mean, after all, Haydn, Mozart, these were local guys in little towns, right? It, right? Why would that, why as we're talking, has probably another orchestra been created in China? 
right? The time we started talking. And it's a Western orchestra. And why do the Chinese government believe that this is to the benefit of their people? Because if they didn't think it was for the benefit of their people, it would not How many happen. Western things they want in there. Exactly well, right. This so, so this is the, one of the great, you know, this is the de facto truth of what became world music because of this language that the Greeks first wrote about that is acquisitive, that is omnivorous, and that takes on other influences but continues to proliferate and continues to change and is always contemporary. I'm going to have the last word here. Um, and that is that I always say the same. This is a statement, not a question, which is that I look at people who, are, who I really have faith in as public servants who are really, really, I think are really, they get it. And I say, my God, you could have brought to bear all your gifts to make money. You could be on Wall Street. You could be an architect. You could be, you could be making a lot of money. And instead, you're doing this. You're a senator. Or you're a congressman for the right reasons. Somebody who I really think is giving, and they work in an NGO. They want to try to solve the world's problems, and they're smart, and they're and they're and they're uh, indefatigable, and they have all this energy, and they turn it toward the public good. And they could be making a lot of money in business, and they're not. They forego that. And I look at you, and I think you've got a beautiful head of hair. You're preternaturally verbal, you're trim, you're handsome. You could have been a big movie star, but instead you've given yourself to the classical repertoire. That's our, that's our win. That's our win. I, uh, you never wanted to be an actor? I, I, I don't think I'm a good actor. I'm, I'm just a contagious enthusiast. We'll leave it at that.